Hi listeners, welcome to another Melting Pot episode, which as you know is a weekly episode and I have conversations with guests from all over the world and also from different um, walks of life and my guest today is very special. I don't think I have um, in all the episodes that um, I have actually published, I don't think I've ever talked to, I, I mean, I've talked to people in performing arts, but I don't think I've ever talked to a professional dancer. So that should be a first for me. So uh, Rukmini Vijay Kumar is my special guest today. Um, Rukmini is as you know, you figured, a professional Bharatnatyam dancer. She um, started her, her dancing career, not career, but she started sort of learning to dance from the age of eight. Um, and then she's also um, graduated um, from the Boston Conservatory University. Um, and uh, in ballet and modern dance. And um, she also is the founder of and artistic director of Radha Kalpa Dance Company. Not Kalpa, sorry, Radha Kalp Dance Company. Kalpa. Is it actually Kalpa? Oh, really? Because I thought, um, I thought I was going to be really smart. And, you know, because it, it, it shouldn't sound uh, like I'm very Western and all that. So I said, I'm going to just um, uh, try that. But clearly I was not right. So, okay, so Radha Kalpa. And um, I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Rukmini, for being a part of Melting Pot and, um, and sharing your story and your journey with my listeners and with me. So welcome to Melting Pot. Thank you for having me. Such a pleasure to be here virtually today. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Um, so Rukmini, where did it all begin for you? Um, dancing, I think, is, uh, it's been a part of my life as far as I can remember. And um, I used to, um, it's my, my formal education I started when I was seven or eight. But I actually started dancing earlier. Uh, in seven, when I was seven or eight, I restarted learning Bharatanatyam. So when I was very young, I would uh, watch my mom uh, because she used to go to Bharatanatyam class, and um, uh, and I wanted to go. And when we were, when I was very small, we moved to the U.S. So then I I did ballet for a little while, and um, when we came back to India, I continued with Bharatanatyam. So there was this initial, I mean, an initial exposure to Bharatanatyam, then I did ballet for a few years, and then I came back to Bharatanatyam. When did you come back to India from the US? I think I must have been in um, third or fourth. Okay, so third. you were still very young when you came yeah. back. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So, yeah. uh, so that, that's why my, my ballet was very small. I didn't really do much of it. Like maybe two years when I was very young. Um, and then, uh, then obviously it was just Bharatanatyam because I was back in India and, um, yeah, that's how it all began. It began with watching my mom and, uh, wanting to dance like everyone in her class. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. So, um, so then you moved on. So did you not go back to the U S? Um, to... I did oh. um, because most of our family remained there. Okay. Even if family moved back, um, I um, I continued with my Bharatanatyam training, and I didn't do any ballet or um, modern for a long time until in my teens when I started again. So I would go in the summers, and I would go to a dance studio which was near my uh, cousin's house and spend summers going there. And then I, obviously the rest of the year, I would just live in my dance teacher's house, like my <laughs> teacher's house. Right. And um, so I, it kind of restarted again. And I also started learning with the ballet teacher who had moved to India at that time. And um, then I went back for college and college was in 
um, it, it's a conservatory, so we just did, uh, it's a performing arts conservatory. Right. And so I did um, ballet and modern there and it kind of switched. So I would, I did ballet and modern and then I came back to India and continued to live at my teacher's house. Right. So um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of how, how it was. Those are my training, you know, intensive training years. So they, they are completely different dance forms, right? Uh, but so what is the, is there a commonality between the two dance forms? Um, I think that as a performer, there is this performance quality that exists when you are on stage. It doesn't matter what kind of dance you practice or what kind of performance medium that you uh, engage in. Uh, there is a performance quality in terms of presentation or owning space and stage. All of that is the same throughout all performing art forms. It, it doesn't even matter whether it's dance or music. And there is also, um, there are some similarities with respect to uh, how you use, um, you know, your center and your core and ballet is also very turned out, Bharatanatyam also we turn out. Yeah. So there's some crossover in terms of muscle engagement, uh, but the intentions of the art forms and where they came from are totally different. But I think as a teenager for me, um, sometimes we're enamored by things of the West. We, I also had this, you know, memory of, uh, you know, in my childhood when Your I did- younger days, yeah, yeah. Um, though it was a very short time, I think that there was something about it, you know, that I that I liked. And um, I just wanted to dance. For me, it didn't really matter what dance it was. Like, I just liked to move. Yeah. So at that time, I would do any dance. You name it, I would, I would want to, you know, I would want to go. So it didn't matter if it was hip hop or flamenco, like every, everything enamored me. Um, I was very bad at hip hop. <laughs> found a flamenco teacher but I think that Bharatanatyam I gravitated towards because there's also a cultural layering that um, I connect to and I'm a part of and so I I think that with Bharatanatyam it came easier not just the physicality of it but also the intention and the you know the I don't know the background from which it comes you know uh, the cultural aesthetic and all of that because I, I mean, I am inherently an Indian and I grew up in India. So there are many things um, of the form that I connected to. So after studying at the conservatory, I mean, I, I considered doing modern for a while. And I mean, I was never a ballerina. People say I studied ballet, but I was never a ballerina. I never really danced. I mean, I wore my point shoes for a while, but I never really. like. You didn't never, really take to it. I didn't. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. physically, but there's also a big gap, you know, I studied when I was really small, then I started in my late teens. So there's a huge gap for ballet. And um, most people, if you really want to be uh, amazing ballet dancers, you never have that gap. Um, there's no way for me to, you know, um, and the, it's also a lot about is gymnastic in some ways, and there is artistry, but um, your body needs to lend itself to so many things uh, physically with ballet. Yeah. So I do it for technique and I enjoy the form, but I'm not really a ballerina. But um, with modern and contemporary dance, there is a point where I was in the middle of these roads and I, I was thinking, which way do I go? Right. And um, I spent some time in New York, you know, auditioning for companies and going through some things. And then one day I was just like, no, I, I need to go and do Bharatanatyam. And so I came, I came home and uh, I still do uh, contemporary work now, but a large portion of it, I, um, I explore contemporary thought with my Bharatanatyam vocabulary. And I feel I find more strength and grounding uh, to come from that place. Okay, so so with Bharatanatyam, you did not feel like you were mentioning that with um, ballet, um, if there's a gap, um, you know, it does sort of, uh, it's not the same thing. But with Bharatanatyam, because you, you would have had a gap of a few years, right? Um, or did you continue because your mom um, 
was a Bharatanatyam dancer. So even at home, you were kind of uh, practicing it or you were learning. Um, I didn't really have a gap with Bharatanatyam because okay. I was very young, maybe when I was five or six, I had four or five, like I would have gone to class for a little bit. And then I did ballet. And at that age, as long as you're studying movement, it's fine. Yeah. So, yeah. so it really doesn't matter before you're seven or eight. So if you're exposed to movement, so even me going to ballet class or watching performances or trying to jump and do cartwheels on my own, all of that would count towards, you know, movement training. So yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't really matter before you're eight. Um, and uh, after I was eight, I've never had a gap with Bharatanatyam. Even when I was in... Um, when you were at the... Uh, the, the I was in a place where I was choreographing on my own. I was already doing solo performances in Bharatanatyam. So I was in a place where I could practice on my own. On your own. So your own. I would yeah. practice a lot on my own. And yeah. the three months of the summer, I literally, I didn't leave my dance teacher's house until she kicked me out. So, <laughs> so, so she would, um, this, was a, this was a daily conversation. So I would go in the morning as early as she let me go. Um, she didn't, I mean, she, I would, I, I mean, I would go to yoga class first. So I would finish because my yoga teacher is the only one who would, who could bear to see me at like 5.30 or 6 in the morning. <laughs> so I would finish two classes with him. And then I would go to uh, my Bharatanatyam teacher, Narmada auntie's house by like, I don't know, nine o'clock or something like that, straight 8.30 or nine. Um, yeah. And I would dance and then someone else would come. She would always have these individual lessons like with, single people because that's how classical Indian dance is taught largely you know um, and I would continue to dance with whoever came then around 1 30 she'll say go home I'll eat lunch so I'll say it's fine you can eat lunch I'll just wait here <laughs> you can eat lunch and come back I can continue to dance thought, oh my god oh, she's, she's like how do I get rid of this <laughs> she's uh, Thank no, you. I think she would also appreciated the fact that you had this um, drive in you, right, of wanting yeah. uh, to absorb as much as you could, and you didn't you didn't want to waste any time over it. So I think that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, but now as a teacher, I think back. <laughs> I think, oh my gosh, she was really so patient with me. Right. Um, so she say, "Go home and come back." So I'd be like. Uh, after bed, I say, okay, what time? Can I come back at three? And she say, no, no, I need to sleep for a while. Come back at five. I say, okay, auntie, I'll come at four. <laughs> so, oh um, so it was, I think the summers were always in our house. Like I would, I would literally, I, I went nowhere. Um, I didn't have a big social life. So I never like, you know, like went out or that. None of that was a really big thing for me. Right. So, Oh, I would just be in Narmadani's house and um, uh, Sundriyaka's house, actually, also, who's my other Bharatanatyam teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how you you spent your summers. Yeah. So then how did um, Radha, and I'm going to say it absolutely correctly, Radha Kalpa, how did that come about? Um, I came back from college in 2008. And um, I started immediately making, and I was finding my footing, you know, like, because I'd come from a very, like, modern, like, um, uh, training background. And so I didn't know whether I wanted to continue to create in that vocabulary separately. Um, I kept the two vocabularies very separate. So I kept my Bharatanatyam separate and my contemporary work very, very separate for a while. So the first two years I spent like making things that were in contemporary, um, that were in the contemporary movement vocabulary as we deem as contemporary movement. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think it's a movement vocabulary. I think it's a thought process, but at that time I still hadn't figured it out. Right. So, um, so I would do that and I would do a lot of um, jazz and, you know, like, um, um, and continue to make my Bharatanatyam. And at that time, I started dancing with a friend of mine. And we began dancing in a, in a duet. Um, 
kind of. So for two years when we were dancing a duet, we I came up with this name because um, I I wanted to call it something, you know. So I called it the Radha Kalpa Dance Company. So um, that's how it started. And after a few years, and we also tried, I mean, I also tried working on ensemble and all that. Like everything was like, you know, I was... Uh, very you know, finding your ground and you yeah I was trying yeah. to figure out what I needed to do and yeah. all of that uh, I started teaching a little bit and um, but by 2010 so it took me two years to do all of this and all of that 2010 I was like I'm not going to teach anymore I just shut down my <laughs> my teaching and um, the end of 2010 yeah I said I I need to work on solo and I'm not going to do ensemble work. And um, whenever I commissioned, I'll do ensemble work. Yeah, so what prompted what prompted um, that decision? I think it was draining me. And I was beginning to, uh, because I'm someone like for, for 10 years before that, you know. So I spent three years just dancing before going to college. So the four years of college, plus these two years, plus the three years before that, so for 10 years, I had danced morning to night without ever, literally morning to night, I would wake up at 5.30 and I would start dancing by 6. And I would be moving for 10, 12 hours a day and that would be a normal day. And I don't think until that time, I ever felt drained by it. Mm. I always felt invigorated by it, you know. And with the classes and the ensemble and all this stuff, I was like, I'm feeling too overwhelmed and I'm, I'm, I'm losing the joy that I have in it. So then I said, I just want to work on my um, developing my artistry, yeah. which is important for me at this time, because I'm still not, you know, like um, established as a solo. I haven't found my ground yet. So I, um, I, I just blanket, I stopped teaching. I asked my students to go to other uh, teachers at that time. And then I, um, I took like four years after that to, and I didn't, I didn't teach. I worked on myself and I did do ensemble productions, but they were commissioned. So okay. it wasn't something that I was trying to do all the time. So it would be for a short period of three months of the year. And then I would tour it and finish. And um, yeah, so I, I mean, it was um, very, it was really, really nice for me to, make that decision and take that time to kind of just work on on myself. And um, yeah, so Radha Kalpa remained, but uh, it would be like... You had other teachers uh, within Radha Kalpa who were then um, the students? No. Not at that time, no. I was Not young. Okay. Yeah, young. I was just in my like early 20s. So I, I, I mean, I didn't... I didn't have like people I trained and that they would take over or anything right, like that. Right, 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 right. Um, but in um, uh, the but the ensemble productions that I did and the solo productions, so it started becoming like I would make one or two solo productions in the year, and I would end up working on one ensemble uh, large productions, which was largely with freelance dancers. So it happened once a year, once every two years. I think in two thousand. 13, I made one in 2014, I made one, then 15 was a gap and again in 16, like that, you know. Um, so it, it but there must be a lot of effort going into um, whether it's a solo performance or it's um, like you mentioned an ensemble, even if it's commissioned, there must yeah. be a lot of different factors that go into it, right, in terms of the production in terms of um, what it is that you want uh, out of it and in terms of uh, obviously the performance, the practice, the, you know, the rehearsals, the, the whole concept, all of that must be pretty time consuming for you to not then be able to do like five um, solo performances in a year, right? I mean, um, like they would, I usually any i think any choreographer artist when they when they make work we take a long time to arrive at yeah so in a year i would make possibly two solo productions 
um, and one ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. And in the last five years, it's kind of regularized. So I make a little bit more than that. Like I make um, a lot of work on my students, which I don't even count. So those are just like traditional margam and that like Tilanas and Pushpanjali's, all those kind of things. That's just like an ongoing job. So that I just keep making. So I don't put that into my choreographic forte. But I make one um, traditional margam on myself, one um, contemporary work, which is a full um, length contemporary work. Uh, I use the Bharatanatyam vocabulary now. And I started doing that like three, four years ago. Three, I think three, yeah, it must be four years now. Um, four years ago and then I do one ensemble work which is what has been happening the last few years but considering the pandemic I didn't make an ensemble work last year mm -hmm. and I probably will not make one this year so and what about the solo that's possible to do right yeah, the solo work is possible to do yeah. but um, I think I was working on a subject um, last year and I was meant to present and tour and everything by the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Um, by the middle of last year, I realized like there's no point because it's I'm not going to perform it. And um, art, as artists, we're so volatile that I can't decide something now and then wait for a year to perform it because I'm going to change. My thoughts are going to change and what I see in it is going to change. So I would like whenever my research and all of that is done and I have an overall idea of imagery and everything, I like to keep maybe like four months before my first performance and then start working on the final bits then. So now, since I don't know when my first performance is, yeah, I so, kind of... So, um, I mean, the reason why I was asking is that... Um, it would not be possible to do a solo performance virtually to an audience who would then connect to the performance from whichever part of the world uh, they were in. Is that not something that happens? I think it happens, but I'm not so sure that I'm very keen on it okay. because um, my work, I, I make it to be viewed on stage. And there are choices that I make because of a physical audience being there. Um, the direction I walk, the diagonal I take, how long I stand in the center. Um, the, there are so many. There are so many choices that I make um, because I know there is a physical audience sitting there. And I don't make the same choices if I'm dancing in a theater. If I've made the piece for a theater which has a thousand people watching or a thousand five hundred people watching right because yeah. if there are a thousand five hundred people watching i use my body more if largely most of the Bharatanatyam pieces are meant for like i don't know like 400 audience maximum 500 it's a more of an intimate kind of performance um you know uh, setting most Bharatanatyam pieces lend themselves to that so i mean i don't um but if it is on film the choice I would, the choices I would make to convey the same subject, I think would be totally different. And um, do you think the visual impact would also be lost? I think the visual impact, I can use the same subject, which is what I'm starting to do now, is that I'm using the same subject perhaps, but treating it differently because film is a different medium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's not the same as when watching physically. And I know a lot of artists are performing and streaming them virtually. Um, but although initially I, I wanted to watch a lot of artists and I did watch them, uh, I don't want to watch any more shows online. Mm -hmm. I would like to watch them in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> yeah. It's, so, yeah. And, and obviously you being an artist yourself, I mean, I can, I can completely understand that. Um, it's, yeah, it's time for it to be a different, uh, it, it, it can never be back to like it was, not never, but at least for the next couple of years. But 
I think, yeah, I can, I can sense the, not just talking to you, but talking to a lot of other performers that it's, um, it's time and that restlessness to want to get back and to, to have a live audience is now, um, is now starting to happen. So yeah, I completely understand it's that. It's very different because when you make for film, what happens is that the creative process of ideating and all of that is great. Yeah. When you dance itself, um, there is no presence of another human in front of you. Mm. Yeah. And as performers, we feed off of that. In some ways, there are, especially when in performing, I'll try to explain this in like as, as easily. Yeah. As <laughs> as <laughs> yeah. Because when performing, like say, say that I'm feeling an emotion, right? And I'm um, I'm expressing something as a character or whatever. There is that moment where as a performer, I experience it truly and honestly. And at the same time, the audience also experienced that same moment honestly with me. So now there's a huge time gap. So I may experience it like, I don't know, 40 days before. And then I put it on film and then they edit it and then the camera comes in. And then I feel like absolutely nothing. And then we air it. And a lot of audience members feel it at different times, which is totally different. And there is there is value to that as well, because you reach more people, more people can see your work. But it's a different, it's a different type of art. It's not the same um, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I think as performers, we we're accustomed to performing and having people in front of us and um it's that energy that you absorb right also yeah from the audience and we feed off of like if they laugh or they clap we can we respond to it or you can tell if they're moved or not or you know if they're quiet so i think that is um I, i'm learning to work with uh, film yeah. and it, it's, it's very uh it is an enjoyable process. I'm not saying it's not, but I miss being on stage. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully um, it's not going to be long before you are on stage again. Um, you know, how, how important is uh, for performers, and especially like for yourself, you've, um, uh, you spend so much time um, with your craft, whether it's for yourself or whether it's through uh, your school, how important is it to also have other um, interests outside of dance? Um, I think that it's important to live life because we find inspiration for work from, you know, from life from being amongst people, by observing um, society, by, you know, like there's so many things that we create that we can't just create in solitude because what we reflect in performances is life itself. So with that respect, I think it's important for us to participate in our lives because many of us don't. Uh, I'm saying it to myself as well. So it's uh, important to do that because then, um, even just from the respect of your art itself, I'm saying, not just yeah, yeah. But um, I think largely artists were so, um, I don't know, especially for me, I'm so immersed in my dance that I don't do anything else. Hmm. Um, I just, I think dance, if I'm, if I'm running, I'm listening to dancing music, if I'm if I'm in the car, I'm listening to like what I'm choreographing. I mean, it, it, it really doesn't. Um, it, ne it doesn't leave you. It's yeah, it doesn't. It's Even if I'm listening to some other music, the same thing will be running in my mind. Like, how does this apply to the concept that I'm currently working on? So it, um, it's kind of obsessive in a way. Um, and everything I do is for dance. I do yoga for dance i do my strength training for dance i do my cardiovascular for dance and i do enjoy all those things 
on their own separately as well. Uh, but everything feeds into my freelance job. I think in the pandemic is the first time that I've done a few things which have absolutely nothing to do with my dance. And what so, is it that you've done? Um, I started learning golf um, yeah. because I lost my dad recently and he really used to love golf. So I um, inherited his golf clubs and I decided I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start uh, playing. I'm, I'm at I'm at nursery level right now, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm starting and um, I also learned to dive. So I, um, nice. we've been speaking about it for a long time, my husband and I to, you know, learn to dive and we're so enamored with, you know, like the underwater world and the oceans. Right. So we, I just got my advanced diving certificate and yeah, so, so I guess I have two hobbies now. <laughs> yeah, so it's not, it's not, an, um, now you realize that um, it's not only dance and you, it, it's good to sort of get involved. In of course it's good, but yeah. I mean, it's difficult, that's all. It's yeah. just really hard. You sort of disengage yourself. Uh, yeah, no, I can I can understand that because I was um, I don't know if it's the name of a documentary or if um, you know someone who is a performer has said it, but um, or a dancer. Um, it you know I I picked it up somewhere that a dancer dies twice. Yeah, <laughs> and um, the first time is very very painful so that is the time i guess when a dancer stops dancing for whatever reason yeah mm -hmm. i mean is that something that um connects with you you're still very young and you have you know many many years um ahead of you and you've also got a legacy that you have um, kind of established through mm -hmm. your school uh, but personally, is that something that you would agree with? And how do you feel about that? I think that's something that I have thought about. And I think it, it would definitely be if a day like that ever came to face me, is that um, I think I would be devastated, um, definitely. Like, because it's, it's like my, like now there are no performances, but nothing's preventing me from dancing. Yeah. So I'm still dancing every day. I'm going to the studio, I'm doing my things. Like nothing's preventing me from dancing per se. So I can still dance morning to night, just as I always was. In fact, the first eight, nine months of the uh, the uh, the lockdown, yeah. I danced more than I danced because I didn't have to travel. Yeah. I didn't take any flights. I wasn't teaching. So yeah, yeah. I spent so much more time dancing. And I mean, I I think amidst personal loss, I was a bit, um, I, I, I deviated a bit, you know, like, and I, I took that time to kind of just, um, I was finding it hard to dance for a few months. But um, I think that if you say I can't dance at all, like because of an illness or some physicality, I think that that would be, um, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't even want to imagine it. <laughs> I think my family will suffer more than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, mm. so I think it's, yeah, that, that is true. But I think if it's, if it's something that happens because of age and I'm unable to move anymore and then it, it you know, it progresses, I've, I think I've come to, I think I'm, I've prepared myself to be at peace with that because I know that I love teaching. I love watching my students dance. I love creating uh, things. I love making things. So even if I physically not at my peak anymore, I'm pretty sure I can make impactful work through others' bodies, through um, film, hopefully, because I'm learning that medium and um, through other things, because storytelling is what I enjoy. And if I can't do if I can't do it through my body yeah, or if, people, yeah. if my body is unable to tell the stories as effectively, I can dance in my room for my own happiness and I can, <laughs> I can use other people's bodies to do that. Yeah. 
so that's that's what I meant with legacy. Um, you can you can still impart the knowledge that and the experience. Not that it's going to happen for a while, but it, I was just curious because. You know, it, it just caught my attention when I read about it. And I said, um, and then there were a lot of um, uh, performer dancers who picked up on it and have things to say about it, which is why I thought it would be interesting to hear your perspective um, about it as well. That's why classical Indian dancers, at the, because it's more forgiving uh, physically, um, there are dancers who are like 70, 75, uh, who still perform. And um, it's, not, it's not something that's like looked down on, like because in the Western world, your body tells a story. Mm -hmm. But in classical Indian dance forms, there is that aesthetic shift that um, culturally we accept. And it's okay if you're not doing like your physicality to the maximum because you have something else to offer at that time, you know? So, um, yeah, we're more forgiving in, in, in that the sense. Yeah. So yeah, which is good, <laughs> which is good. It helps in, um, keeping the, um, the, I don't know if fashion is a right word to use, but it just helps keeping it alive, right. Within use that spark. It, you know, it helps, yeah. So what uh, have you, um, I'm not sure, which is why I'm asking, have you done any cinema? As in, not uh, dance, but as a, as have you acted in any cinema? Uh, I have, I've done a few films. Okay. In um, Tamil um, and uh, Canada and one, I've done a guest appearance in one Hindi film, but yeah. That's it. And, and, well, yeah. Oh, and so whatever you've done, has it been linked to dance or no? Okay, which is great. So, yeah. I think in two films, I did have a dancing kind of uh, uh, role. Um, but I mean, there was a dance, but the Indian movies have dance anyway. Dance anyways, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I had like two pieces that were like, you know, where I danced, but the others not, I mean, there's dance in them and I do dance, but I don't, that's not the, yeah, actually I've danced in almost all of them, but it's just like, it's, it's not a dance oriented yeah, movie. So that's what I was asking if uh, your character uh, was essentially a dancer, or there was that only background. one of them. Only in one. Only of them. one of them. Okay. Yeah. So, what is uh, Radha uh, Kalpa method? Um, that's basically. I think that when um, when I started studying uh, Bharatanatyam when I was a kid, uh, we didn't because of the lineage of how it's passed down, I think there's a lot of knowledge that was lost in terms of um, learning physicality, the science of it and all of that, you know. So um, we weren't trained with anatomical awareness. We were trained with um, a skill-based progression. And what happens, and even today, more than 99.9% .9 of uh, training in the classical Indian dance forms happens from a skill-based perspective, which is why there's so many dancers who have injuries, who sustain um, lower back injuries, knee problems, ankle problems, and so many of them stop dancing because they have these issues. Um, the awareness of physicality and anatomy is growing, like largely now, and a lot of people are, are changing. But this was something I started doing over, I wanna say like 15 years ago, Okay. years ago so i um so did you actually study it yeah so it started kind of like a social kind of um uh, thing so i i actually before even before i went to college i'd i'd gone to a few dance classes and i'd asked what do you do for a warm-up or what are the injuries you have and so there was an interest that i had like i, I want to say it must have been like 2002 or something like that you know so like 18 years ago. So, and then I, I would write down and then I, I was, I would participate in all these online forums that used to be there, like, because the internet had just come in and, um, you know, kind of ask like, there are these injuries, why do you get that? And 
So in um, college, I, I went to the Boston Conservatory, but I studied anatomy and physiology and exercise physiology in Boston University over uh, uh, as a summer program. But it's the, basically the course that the physiotherapists take. So I studied that and I did some other courses which were online from UCLA on biomechanics and nutrition and some other things that kind of supplemented it. And um, I think the Radha Kalpa method is a is kind of... Um, Okay. How do I say? Uh, it's uh, it's something that I arrived at from the different learning that I had. Like, so I can't say that this is from this, this is from this, this is from this. So you basically you picked whatever you thought would be relevant. There are things that I have understood from being in yoga class. Things I've understood from being in Pilates class, from um, from my Alexander teacher, from my ballet teacher, from modern pedagogy from my Bharatanatyam teachers from Karana. So the, the, the learning is like in so many different places and it also encompasses um, intent and uh, uh, this is a physical part of it, but the method also encompasses intent, imagination and creative impetus, which comes some a bit from my theater training, um, some bit from conversations with one of my teachers, you know, so it, it, it's a lot from different places and the method overall is about how to create a neutral body um, that's effective in performance, uh, that's versatile, injury free, and at the same time, um, create a performer that has intent and cohesive imagination. So, but because even Abhinaya, we would learn as like from a gesture and then we would imagine. But I start in the Radha Kalpa method from when the kids, they start imagining space first. Mm. Gesture comes later. So the aesthetics of keeping your elbow up and having the right hasta and all of that comes later. But I first teach them how to visualize and imagine and where that comes from. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, uh, it's, a, very, it's very holistic. It's, yeah is what you're, you're saying. And yeah. so you've created a program. You've actually written up a program and that's yeah. that's the Radha Kalpa method. Okay, mm, that's that's very interesting. So currently, how many students do you have uh, in your I, mm, I teach very small number of students. Okay. I have only um, eight students, eight children who have been with me from when they were four or five years old. And uh, so now they are 10 and 11, um, that age. So they are probably the only ones who have started out from when they were small in this method. And they are, you know, they've grown with it. Uh, before the lockdown, I also had a group of adult students who had come to me who wanted to be professional dancers, who were learning with me full time for almost three to four years. Um, basically, they started when I started teaching again like right. 2014 I think yeah uh, so they um, so they are also there but most of them were you know like they're all um, um, they're also teachers now all of them and they're professional dancers so when the lockdown happened I kind of suspended their classes because they're all okay to manage on their own oh, right um, yeah and then I take in uh, I have a group of ongoing students, which I started again on an online program. So because I am a performer, it's difficult for me to um, take in many batches and teach hundreds of students. So um, and have you trained anyone to uh, and not help you, but have, you know, to sort of um, like eventually you'll start to travel um, with your solo performances. Right. And, um, so is there anyone who would then yeah. kind of take over? the past over? four years when yeah. um, I kind of had a full-time company at that time for like two and a half years, I had a full-time company of dancers. So after the hiatus of not doing ensemble work between, uh, I want to say, 2016 and 19 or 15 and 19 I made see I think 16 and 19 I made like I don't know like four like five full-length productions on uh, on an ensemble 
and you travel oh. and you traveled with oh, the ensemble is, because they are younger and they're newer right I, it were, a large portion of it was them training right so the first two productions were more for them to learn so and it's a lot more money a lot more funding so until they become like you know grounded and established it's impossible to say hey take this whole company so um the first two productions kind of made them get the grounding the next um the next one was experimental in nature and the next two were solid they were good they were good to tour and um this is kind of ensembles were your students these ensembles were yeah they were all my students all your students okay. there was uh eight of them so six of them were full time and two of them were like kind of part time right so um but because of the lockdown and all of this you know like thing happening um and before that as well the company didn't have funding i couldn't keep eight of them full time and like the salaries it's, i mean it's it's hard with the arts right yeah. so we kind of like taken a hiatus like about 8 9 months before the lockdown even and um, so then when the lockdown happened i kind of said like um, i mean everyone just because they were also all teachers and they're all doing their own thing simultaneously so uh, that group was doing their own thing but the some of them used to teach for me so they would handle my classes and take care of the kids when i went right um but now it's okay the kids will be fine even when i travel and yeah. i'm i don't plan on taking more batches or anything because it's uh, this pandemic has changed too many things yeah that is so true so <laughs> as soon as um the pandemic kind of i mean it's slowly coming um in in control but yeah. as soon as you're able to actually I don't say freedom is not the right word but you know as you're able to actually start to things get back to normal um what is the first thing that you would want to do perform <laughs> <laughs> yeah so are you are you starting to prepare i did i'm always prepared i do okay. <laughs> <laughs> i'm always rehearsed right i have like all my productions that are in um you know like uh, the full length productions like i have three that were in performance right i can dance any of those yeah okay good so then you're you i mean as soon as things get normal okay. it's easing up in bangalore okay uh, but i mean i never danced only in bangalore right so yeah. i can't do like all 40 of my shows in bangalore like it doesn't work like that yeah yeah so it's more about the restrictions on travel that are the issue right now so performances are opening up locally in each place but to get from one place to travel and going and coming all that is an issue right now yeah, it so, still needs a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, planning and it needs i mean it needs a, yeah a lot of energy goes into that anyways so i yeah. did one show in january okay i'm probably going to do another one in april oh, that um, But, i mean this is very this is very odd for someone who used to perform like twice a week we you know i can imagine wow i can imagine but you know i guess you've held it all together which is fantastic um and i think a lot of us have and um i'm sure things things can only be looking upwards uh, from now <laughs> on so that's the so, good part it can't get worse than this it can't get worse than this yeah so we just have to be very optimistic we've been so patient um and we uh yeah and things will open up and we will move ahead and i think that's and that's going to happen with you as well but this has been absolutely um fabulous talking to you thank you so much for um your time and you know and i th- and i've learned so much as well and i'm sure my listeners uh, will also when the episode gets published so just before signing off um would you have like with all your experience um anyone who is aspiring to be a dancer a couple of tips for them um 
I think the only thing I would, I always say is that uh, one thing is be consistent and there'll be days where you just don't want to dance, but try to coax yourself into the studio and do as much as you can. And the last and most important thing is that um, you have to love dancing, irrespective of where you dance, when you dance, how you dance, who watches you dance, who doesn't watch you dance. And um, if you love dancing, everything else comes as a fallout. Performance or, um, I don't know, talks or teaching, invite, every, everything uh, will come as a plus, including financial stability. So uh, first, there must be a need to grow uh, within yourself and you are your own competition, nobody else's. Yeah, so true. Yeah. On that note, again, thank you so much, Rukmini. Um, and we'll speak to you again soon. Take care. Keep thank smiling. You. And I'm sure I'm going to hear very soon that you have already started traveling with your performances. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever will be, will be. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Thank you, Payal. Thank you so much.